So Father Kolbenbach's statement here, and I will not read this out loud to you, but I'm just going to highlight uh, two very important parts, which is the education, that is the totality of the liberal arts education, bringing together the natural and social sciences and the performing arts with all the branches of knowledge to form you, right? To give you the opportunity to form as a person and live a meaningful life of leadership and service. Um, that's what unifies the college. And I think that you'll discover across all of our departments and disciplines, no matter what you decide to study, this is a kind of our common um, project and, and our common grounding. Um, the thing that really stands out here for me is the way then that our students, no matter, you know, Hoffman, you're studying biology, um, you know, Brittany, you're studying political science, and how many minors do you have? You have three. Uh, what you have in common is this. I think it's uh, a project for us that really creates the conditions for you to, uh, to foster inquiry, creativity, collaboration, and leadership. So we start there. Um, but I want to get more specific. Um, a degree from the college is very powerful in many ways. As I highlighted Foundations for Learning and Leadership in the last slide, one of the things that you all know well is that you live in a really rapidly changing world. Um, I think high school students are being asked to do more and do it better and do it earlier than previous generations of students. The world is changing very rapidly. So I wanna point out that a degree from the college is really powerful in very practical ways because of the rapid change. Uh, we wanna deliver an education that empowers you and prepares you with the knowledge and the skills and the creativity to be adaptable and to be flexible. And what we've found over the, the years is that when we speak to employers, when we speak to in, internship managers, when we speak to all kinds of organizations, uh, for-profit, non-profit, the point here is employers value the outcomes of a liberal arts education. So when they describe the kinds of graduates that they wanna hire, do they describe wanting a specific major? or a combination of majors and minors, typically not. What they usually do is describe a list of skills and characteristics. So what I'm gonna show you next is some data. This comes from the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Um, so to the question of when employers describe the kind of graduates they wanna hire, these are the top 20 qualities and characteristics. These are the skills and habits that they're describing. And when you look over this list, uh, from the top communication skills, problem solving, um, analytical and quantitative skills, work ethic, all the way down the list to being tactful, creative, entrepreneurial. None of those are a major, right? And I think that's what really stands out when you look at employer level data is that we regularly talk to people who, um, and, unless it's very, very specific, of course, in some technical fields, for the most part, Students can major in things that they're interested in, that they wanna be doing, and there are a variety of paths for them to follow. Um, we see people from English majors with writing concentrations being hired into uh, executive training programs. Um, we see biology majors. Yes, Hoffman, you're, you're a biology and a pre-med track, but as you know, in your department, they educate you very quickly on probably dozens and dozens of career opportunities and tracks that might be outside of health sciences or medical school. So keep in mind that this is really about skill building and formation, and you're well prepared. As I said, high school students are being asked to do more and do it earlier. Um, I think students are arriving at college and at university maybe more prepared than they've ever been, and we'd like to see you continue on that path. Okay, great. So um, let's get a little more specific about what it would look like to get a major in the College of Arts and Sciences. And there's two threads that we're gonna describe. Um, one is the courses that you take in the university core curriculum throughout four years. Um, and then there are the courses that you take in the major. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the core curriculum and we'll ask the students, I mean, the ambassadors about it. And then Matt's gonna tell you more about the different majors and minors that we offer. So the core curriculum is a set of courses that you take throughout the four years in the areas that are listed here. And we'll see these same uh, disciplinary areas represented on the next slide. So I'm not gonna go into them here. 
But the point is that all students are going to take uh, these courses and these provide you the foundational skills for all of your other coursework and all the work that you'll do in your major. So the next slide will show you, it's a chart that shows you the structure of the university core. So our core is not a set of courses that you get out of the way for your general education requirements in the first year or so. Instead, it's a structured experience throughout the four years that has a central theme. And that theme is how do we educate students to become women and men for a more just and humane global community. And each year from freshman to senior, the courses in the core are centered around a, a key question. And so you can see those questions in the middle column in freshman year, it's how do we pursue knowledge and cultivate understanding? Sophomore year, who are we and what does it mean to be human? Junior year, what principles characterize a well-lived life? And senior year, what is our role in the world? So in terms of the courses that you take each year, uh, let's take a look at the top band, year one courses. You would take a first year seminar, which I'll say a little bit more about because they're really interesting. A course in writing, a course in reasoning, that's critical thinking, uh, math, scientific inquiry, and communication and speech. The first year seminar is a uh, a course that has a topic that can be approached from multiple disciplines. And that's the idea of the course is to show you what it's like to study from multiple disciplines because that's what you're gonna be doing throughout your, your time at Gonzaga. So let me give you a couple of examples of first year seminar topics so you can see what I mean. One of them is called the art and science of dance. And it's taught by two professors. One is a dance professor and the other is a biology professor. So in this first year seminar, and by the way, a seminar is a, a small class, 20 students. Um, in this seminar, students learn about choreography and dance, but they also learn about the, physio the science side of it, the physiology of dance, the evolution of how and why we dance. Um, so you can see that interdisciplinary kind of interplay in the theme of that uh, first year seminar. And so these are really, you get an interesting set of topics that you can choose from um, in, in choosing your first year seminar. A couple of other examples are, um, one's called internet memes and digital culture. Another one is called social justice and science fiction. So anyway, that's one of the first year courses in that set of courses. In years two and three, you take in the core courses in philosophy, philosophy of human nature and ethics, and courses in religious studies, one course in Christianity and Catholic traditions, and another in world or comparative religions. And then senior year, you take a core integration seminar. This is again, a small class, a seminar of 20 students. That's a culminating experience. It's supposed to culminate or bring together everything that you've learned in the four years of the core, but also combined with what you're learning in your major. And these courses focus on a contemporary problem or issue that encourages you to, to integrate all that material and encourages collaboration and problem solving. And then the final point I wanna make about the core is that if you look at that Navy band at the bottom of the chart, throughout the four years, you're taking courses in these areas, fine arts, history, literature, and social science, as well as courses that have an emphasis on writing, global studies, and social justice. So that's the, the structure of it, the theme of it, but I'd like to turn to the ambassadors and ask them to comment as they would like to um, on the university core and their experience of it so you can kind of get a feel for what it's like. Hoffman, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Um, so when I came to Gonzaga, I, I, have, I too also thought core was just something to get out of the way. Um, but as I, as the years went on, um, I realized that the, the Jesuit model of educating the person as a whole becomes really uh, evident. And there's a lot of interesting classes everywhere. Is, um, anything you're, that you're interested in, there's a class that you can take. And I believe that these core classes aren't something just to get out of the way. I think uh, one shouldn't a student students here should enjoy their time and to take in whatever's uh, whatever class they're taking 
So true. Um, Brittany, anything that you would add? I'm sorry, my Wi-Fi cut out a bit. What was the question? Oh, just if you have anything you'd like to say about your core curriculum experience. Oh yeah, um, I have loved the core curriculum so far. Um, I, it, I've i taken courses in which I would never anticipate taking courses such as philosophy um, and math. I came to college, never wanting to take another math class, but there I was and I've enjoyed all of them. Um, and actually my writing 101 class prompted me to add a writing minor. So I think it's a really great way to experience classes outside your major um, and get a really well-rounded education at the same time. Thanks to you both. And now, as I mentioned, Matt's going to tell you, we're going to shift from the core to majors and Matt's going to talk to you about the, the many options that we have for you there. All right, thank you. Um, so hopefully the, the core um, overview kind of gives you a sense of how you step into college and then start to build some of these skills and qualities that are so important. But ultimately, uh, everyone wants to turn their attention to the big question, what am I going to major in? Right, And as I said, we have a broad array of opportunities. Um, these are the departments in the college. Um, and we've got, uh, as I said, fine arts, humanities, social and behavioral sciences, and uh, the bench sciences and, and math. So you look at this range of opportunities and it, be, it can be kind of overwhelming. Um, but the good news is you have a lot of options and you have time. You have time to explore. Um, as I um, mentioned earlier, your core curriculum is really a skill building opportunity. And this is also the opportunity for you to start to explore what your interests are. Um, are you an aspiring journalist? Um, do you know you want to work in the health sciences? If so, what does that mean? Do I have to major in biology? Can I major in a non-science and still go to medical school? Yes, you can. Uh, last year, we had two of our top medical school bound students both as music majors. Um, so when you look at the range of opportunities, let's look, just take an overview, uh, take a moment for an overview here. Um, English offers both a literature uh, and writing track, um, integrated media, if you look at this uh, offering here, that's actually three different opportunities. That's broadcasting, journalism, and public relations. So if you have interest in any of those areas, you'd, you'd wanna look closely at the integrated media department. Um, international studies, there are subspecialties in international studies. You often see students pair that with a political science or a history major, no surprise. Um, we do offer pre-professional advising. Uh, many of you may be interested in pre-law or pre-health or some kind of pre-professional track. Um, Pre-law, for example, would not be a major, though it would be a track, and you can major in anything you want uh, and get pre-law guidance and advising. That's also true of, of medical school. Uh, you know, Hoffman knows he wants to go to med school, but he's, he's a biology major, uh, taking a Bachelor of Science in Biology, but in the, in the pre-med uh, track. Um, all of the majors have a capstone or a culminating experience. That's during your senior year, typically the last semester of your senior year, um, where you demonstrate your expertise in the major. Um, that's usually done with a capstone project, a major research project, or a comprehensive or field exam. So you're really, um, you know, you're really, you're getting breadth, you're getting depth um, that's really grounded in the Ignatian and Jesuit um, model that we started this presentation with. Some of you know what majors you want to declare, um, others may not know, and that's just fine. I think that that is often the biggest worry. This fall, I had 12 new uh, first year students join my advising pool, so I'm their academic advisor. Um, more than two thirds of them are undeclared, and they have time. Um, they're exploring their options. Uh, we'd like you to explore, discover new interests once you're here. And if you don't know what you want to major in right away, you're fine. Um, we're here to help you to have those conversations, um, to give you resources and information to help you make the best decisions for you. And Matt, um, can I interrupt you right there? Because um, we have a great question in the chat just about that, of asking about what kinds of resources we have for students who aren't sure what they'd like to major in. 
Yeah, um, I would start first with your academic advisor. That connection is so important. And I mentioned getting 12 new students in my advising pool. I'm, uh, I meet with them regularly, um, not just pre-registration. I met with them one yesterday afternoon at three o'clock. Um, this uh, student is thinking of declaring a psychology major, but he's not sure. So first and foremost, you wanna have the conversation with your academic advisor. Um, there are a number of other resources that I would point to as well, which is we have a professional academic advising office. And I would take advantage early on of the resources in career and professional de development around um, exploring your uh, interests, your strengths, and doing some um, uh, work with them to specifically hone in on your skills and, and your uh, uh, qualities. I think some of that work and self-reflection in conversation with resources in career and professional development, your faculty advisor and other advising resources on campus are all very important and foundational in trying to figure out where you wanna go. Um, and then the other strength at Gonzaga, I think is our faculty. Um, speak with your instructors. Um, you know, maybe you're in a, an introductory a science course or a scientific inquiry course or a sociology or a psychology course or an English course. Right away, um, our faculty, I like to say, are, you know, they want to engage you in conversations. So um, don't just think of it as your academic advisor as point of contact. Uh, be willing to walk through the door, go to the office hours, talk to faculty, um, see what opportunities exist in the department of your choice, and you can decide from there if it's a good fit for you and if you're passionate about it. Could I add something there? Um, I would echo what Matt just said. I, in teaching composition and literature courses, I can't tell you the number of students I've said, you should really consider an English major because you, this is a strength for you. Um, and sometimes they're like engineering majors, you know, another school entirely, but your faculty are gonna help you identify what your strengths are. Thanks. Perfect, that's questions? helpful, thank Mary? you. Um, I think we've answered some, we have some students who are interested in taking business classes at the same time as um, having a major in the College of Arts and Sciences. So um, we were just um, in the chat talking about how, yes, absolutely, students can do that. I don't know if anybody has any examples you want to share, but. Um, oh, I have, I have students do this regularly. I have students awesome. um, who are maybe a psychology major and then taking a minor in business or um, you know, other kinds of specific minor or specialty offerings offered in the school of business. And we see the reverse. We see business students um, taking minors from the college. So you can straddle the school and the college, yeah. Um, there's another important piece to learning at Gonzaga, uh, which I'll call experiential learning. This is so important. It's the learning that goes on outside the, the classroom. Best practices in higher education these days tell us that learning outside the classroom is so critical. And in the college, we offer a range of opportunities to do this. Um, they really fall into four areas, service learning, uh, internships, um, supervised research experiences. And I would, I would count study abroad in this as well. Um, there's such a, a, a wonderful array of study abroad opportunities. Once global travel comes back, <laughs> um, we're, we're not jetting around the world to New Zealand or Italy right now, but we will be again. Um, our departments offer service learning courses, a number of them, which combine academic experiences with practical experience and civic engagement. Um, Patricia, I think there are first year seminars, the service learning components, if I remember correctly. So it can start right away in your career. Yeah, so for an example, there was a, an art first year seminar that one project was taking students out into the community and painting murals in a low income um, area of town of Spokane. Um, internships are another really important hands-on experience. I think what is distinctive about us in recent years is that we have an academic piece to all internships. So we have a common course number. So in any department, no matter what department you're in, you can do uh, an internship, but you can also get academic credit for it. It's a 400 level course offering. Um, so if you were in history and you were doing an internship, uh, offsite, you would also be eligible to get credit uh, in History 497, which is an internship designated course. Uh, we found that pairing an academic internship uh, component, which includes some um, uh, academic work 
uh, in tandem with your uh, experiential learning really enhances the experience and makes you a much stronger uh, candidate at the end of that internship. Um, research opportunities are very, very important and growing. More and more undergraduates are getting uh, supervised research experiences. They really enhance your career and the preparation for taking next steps, whether it's professional school, um, graduate school. We're committed to providing undergraduate research experiences to our students, not just in the sciences, but across all of our disciplines. So, of course, um, and Hoffman, maybe you want to speak to this. I don't know if you're working with anyone in biology. You want to, are you doing supervised research yet? Not at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to do a little more preparation before that, but I will be looking into research projects um, by the next year, my senior yeah. year. And that'll put you into your junior year. Um, but the, in the sciences, you can apply to do research with faculty in biology, chemistry and biochemistry. Um, there are summer research opportunities. Some of those are paid, some of those are for credit. In the humanities, we have opportunities for students to do research in the fine arts and the social sciences. Um, we have summer fellowships for students. Um, this last year, in fact, we had six Morris Fellows over the summer do summer long research projects. Those are supervised by faculty and studying a range of diverse topics. Um, the other great thing about Spokane is this is our 18th year of holding the uh, CERC, which is the uh, it's an undergraduate research conference, Spokane Intercollegiate Research Conference. That happens every April. This is an opportunity for all area universities to come together and uh, hold a forum in which undergraduate students can present their work. So these are poster sessions. These are um, conference sessions, small group sessions where um, students are presenting their work and their culminating experience uh, in a larger group, right? So we can partner with local universities and bring together uh, hundreds of undergraduate students um, and they can showcase their work and they have an audience for it, which is really, really valuable. Again, um, being able to present your, your work to a, to a diverse audience. Um, study abroad is, um, I don't know, Kate, uh, let's see. Um, no, Hoffman, you had not gone, um, but I wanted to, I wondered if one of you had. Brittany, you've gone abroad, right? Yes, I did go abroad. You wanna to speak to that experience a little bit and how that worked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I studied abroad this past fall of 2019 in Aix-en-Provence, France. Um, for my international relations major, um, there's a language requirement. So I started taking French classes at Gonzaga. I had never taken them before. Um, and after two years, I moved abroad and lived with a host family and had the best time of my life, traveled all around Europe. Um, and my French was so much better after that um, really immersive experience. And getting abroad, I worked uh, with our Center of, for Global Engagement um, and they really help with every step of the way of getting abroad. Um, I had to get like a visa and there are specific steps for France specifically that I had to do. So they helped with that um, and getting my passport. And they're also a resource to you while you're abroad. Um, so you can always reach out to them. But I had a wonderful time. There were eight other Gonzaga students in my program. Um, and it was all American students in my program. But all of our study abroad experiences look a little bit different depending on like where you live. Uh, if your classes will be entirely in French, m mine were not, thank God. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's different options all across the entire world. Thank you. And study abroad, if, you're, if you think you're interested in it, um, it's just a wonderful way to extend your learning beyond the classroom. Um, it can be part of your program as a major in the college. Um, as Brittany mentioned in international studies, she's got a, a pretty high level language requirement that takes you up through uh, a 300 level language uh, proficiency. So that's, that's demanding. Um, that major's um, uh, gonna require a much more um, uh, focused investment on language acquisition. So language immersion in France is a great way to go for that. Um, a related opportunity to study abroad and, and some of our students have had is applying for for scholarships. Um, we've had students earn prestigious scholarships like Fulbright. Um, and there are such a range of uh, study abroad opportunities now. I would encourage you if you're interested, uh, probably start that freshman year uh, in conversations with your advisor about 
what does planning look like? Even if you think you're going um, second semester, sophomore year, or maybe during your junior year, um, it's pretty critical to start academic planning early on, at least by the end of your freshman year. Um, we have a question on study abroad, just asking about length of time of study abroad. Can you give some descriptions of the different, the different options? Yeah, it's pretty common to go for a single semester. Um, and still about half of our students, or maybe a little over half, still do Gonzaga and Florence. Um, there are summer opportunities uh, for certain constituencies. I mean, certain populations of students can't go abroad for the full semester, especially if their credit you know, heavy or they have a lot of prerequisites. So we have summer options for them as well. Um, the most common option is one semester. Um, we do occasionally see students go abroad for the entire year. Um, that requires pretty intentional planning on your part. I mean, depending on the program you're in, it can be done. And students who want to take advantage of that would just need to start right away consulting with their advisor and with study abroad. Um, I don't know what percentage of students go abroad for the full year. I think it's still relatively small uh, in my experience. I would just add that there are, are some um, short term study abroad uh, opportunities like Literary London or Literary Ireland that take place in late May. And it's about a five week um, commitment. And so that's obviously a lot less expensive too. So that's a good option for some students. And if I could just add with the study abroad options, um, your, if you do a, a program that's during the school year um, and you're at a Gonzaga sponsored program and we have about 30 different countries that we work with about 60 different programs, um, then your tuition stays the same as if you were at GU and your financial aid goes with you. So those are for the Gonzaga sponsored programs and there are quite a few, but that makes it possible for overall, we have about 56% of students studying abroad. Yeah, that's a high percentage. I regularly have people at other universities kind of marvel at, at our study abroad numbers and say, how, how are you doing this? So many students are going abroad and we just have a lot of opportunities. And Carrie, as you mentioned, the advantage of going to a sponsored program and having your tuition go with you and your financial aid go with you makes it a lot more uh, doable financially. All right. Um, so, stop there on experiential learning. Patricia, did you want to say something about faculty? Well, yes. I mean, I think what you just said about, um, you know, doing an insure, internship or, or um, deciding when to do your research, your summer research program or planning study abroad, all those things your faculty advisor can be really helpful with. So I think what you can see from what we've described is that there's so many opportunities that it can be almost overwhelming perhaps, but your faculty advisor is there to help you. So at Gonzaga, um, well, some universities have a, a, a different advising model where they have a staff member who advises hundreds of students. And at Gonzaga, we have a faculty advising model where every faculty member has 15 to 25 students as advisees. That's a very small number. So your advisor gets to know you really well. Um, academic advisors um, can help you at one level with the academic advising and course planning. So um, actually your first the, when you first set foot practically on campus, you know, after you've moved in, we have academic convocation. And immediately after that, you meet with your academic advisor. So they're with you from day one to help you make sure that you're going to make your, you know, meet your 128 credits for uh, graduation, to help you with any sort of resources to know what the policies and procedures are to help you select courses to help you do the four year planning so that you graduate on time and you can work in study abroad and, and things like that the internship. But at another level, uh, your faculty advisors there to ask how you're doing in your classes, as I said earlier to say you know, you're really doing well in the social sciences classes have you considered majoring in that um, and also to help you with career discernment to um, typically, unless it's one of our really big majors, you're going to have a faculty advisor who's in your area of study. 
So they know a lot about career opportunities that can help you think about what you wanna do after graduation. And as I've mentioned, your faculty uh, advisor gets to know you really well. So they're a wonderful source of recommendations for you for whatever you wanna do um, after graduation, whether it's Jesuit Volunteer Corps or graduate school or a job. Um, I remember I've written recommendations for students where I've had that student first year and then senior year. And I can talk about that student's growth over four years. And so it's a pretty wonderful um, ally that you have in your faculty advisor. Um, so uh, Hoffman and, and uh, Brittany, is there anything that you would say about your experience with your faculty, your faculty advisors? I can talk a little bit about that. Um, I have a really great relationship with my faculty advisor. Um, my sophomore year, I added a political science major and the advisor, and she has been so helpful in Zaga. Um, and as well as now, I'm a senior, so I'm applying to lots of postgrad opportunities, and she's writing me letters of recommendations, as well as um, presenting me with different opportunities. So. I'd say faculty advisor is a really important relationship as you go through Gonzaga and we have really wonderful staff and faculty here. Um, what I would say is that uh, I, I think that my faculty, uh, my advisors has been really influential and really helpful to me. Last semester uh, wasn't my greatest semester. I was really struggling with uh, organic chemistry here as a biology student. Um, and she, she, uh, she calmed my nerves. She made me relax right and she she was like no you're fine this is the path you're going to take this is what you need to do to just get caught back up to get caught up and uh i'm on that path right now i'm feeling great and like she put all my worries away and she's always putting them on the right path for uh, uh to graduate on time yeah thanks um i i think you can get from those comments the idea that you know, your faculty advisor isn't there to like hold your hand step by step. They're not there as a parent, but they're there when you need them um, as, as a resource for you, a knowledgeable resource, a knowledgeable caring resource is how I would describe it. So we've gone through all the slides and the, the kind of topics that we wanted to introduce you to. So we have time for questions. Carrie, do you wanna introduce those or, or take us through any of those questions? Yeah, so we have made it through the questions that have been in the chat so far, but please go ahead and add additional questions that you have um, that you would like to have addressed. And we will go ahead and, and take a look at those. I'm also and, sharing- Oh, go ahead. Uh, also sharing on screen both of our contact uh, information. So um, the email, for each of us is listed on this slide, or you can hit our website. I mean, sometimes you go to these sessions and there's so much information to take in and you think of a specific question, but it might be tonight or tomorrow morning at three o'clock in the morning, right? So um, you, you think of these things, uh, don't be shy. Go ahead and just uh, send me an email. Um, you know, if you have something specific on your mind or you wanna be connected with a particular um, department or know about a faculty member in a department. Uh, sometimes we have students who want those specific questions answered. Uh, I'm happy to field those questions and direct you as necessary. If you think of anything large or small, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Perfect. And we do have a question um, in the chat. So can you tell us approximately how many students are enrolled in the College of Arts and Sciences? Well, yeah, uh, our majors of uh, you know, if you, if you look at just the enrollments in the college, it's over two and a half thousand students. Um, however, uh, keep in mind that the college, because we deliver the core curriculum, we see all students. So we teach core curriculum to business students. We teach all of the core curriculum to school of education students. Um, we teach um, engineering students, their core. So we are, we are touching every student in uh, a variety of really important ways. I talk to engineers who tell me that their philosophy uh, requirements were very, very valuable to them, um, that the writing and that the um, critical thinking that they're getting outside of the School of Engineering actually enhances their opportunities and their job prospects. So we see all students and we have about 5,000 undergraduate students. 
Um, the number enrolled in the college or in majors or in combination of majors and minors is uh, right around uh, just, just shy of probably 2,500 at this point. Um, Perfect, that's great. Um, the next question is, are advisors randomly assigned or are they specific to a field of interest? So what um, the advising office does is they, if you have expressed an interest in a major, then the advising office will assign you to a faculty member in that department. If you are, in, there's two exceptions. One is that if you haven't decided, you, you don't indicate what area you're interested in, then you're considered undeclared and you might get assigned to someone in, you know, whoever has the capacity for new advisees. Um, but if, you know, once you decide, let's say uh, second semester of your freshman year, you decide history is my major, then we will um, send you on over to a history uh, faculty member at that time. The other exception is we have a lot of, I think psychology is our biggest major maybe, isn't it Matt, except for maybe biology. Uh, very close, yeah. And there's so many majors um, that it's overwhelming. In, in other words, faculty advisors can't do the one-on-one -on -one kind of things that they want to do. So sometimes in your first year, if as a psychology major, you might get assigned to me as an English teacher. But again, as you, as you go into the program further, we're gonna transfer you over to a psychology faculty member. So the answer is that sometimes it's not exactly random, but um, generally, as soon as we can find a match for you with a subject area that you're interested in, we match you up with an advisor in that area because they're more knowledgeable. Perfect. Great. We got a whole bunch of questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Students change advisors. It's fine to change depending on your interests. So there is movement. Okay, um, let's see. Tyler, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find you a link for your drumline question because I'm not sure that any of us have the answer to that, but I'm gonna tr find you a contact for that. Uh, but could you talk about the tutoring resources that are available to students? So um, in the Foley Center, we have um, an area that brings together all the tutoring um, services. The one that I'm most familiar with is the Writing Center. And so it's not just for students in English classes. It's not just for students in the College of Arts and Sciences. It's for undergraduates, it's for graduate students. And you can go uh, there and take your work, take your assignment. They can talk you through to help you discover what your thesis is and to help you learn to edit your own work better. So that's one example. I know that the math faculty offer their own um, tutoring sessions. Uh, Matt, what would be some other examples? Yeah, I mean, what you're describing in Foley is broadly the Center for Student Academic Success. It, it, and that, that brings together a, a wealth of resources uh, around academic planning. Uh, you mentioned the Writing Center, learning strategies. Um, it's true that departments have specific tutoring operations. Math is a great example. Modern languages is another great example. They have a full-time uh, operation with uh, tutors for um, help in the variety of language uh, instruction that goes on here. Um, so tutoring is both centralized and decentralized, and it really depends on your discipline. I mean, if you need help with writing, the writing center is the obvious place to go. If you're in math, take advantage of the departmental level tutoring operation. Um, if you're taking German and struggling, go to that department. They've got a language lab for you. They've got tutors to help you. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I had to look something up and I'm getting it in, back into here. I'm curious about Abigail's question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I see Abigail's question. So, right, right. Um, and we're sorry that we are only able to offer very limited visits and we know that they fill up. Um, we typically try have tried to post that they're open um, at the, on, uh, um, 
shortly before that next that next month. Um, but we are only able to have the limited visits right now because we're following health guidelines and we don't know for sure when when those will be lifted and when we'll be able to do more. If you are in town and you want to walk around campus, if you give us a heads up, we can give you some good self-guided tour um, information. The buildings are locked, however, and so um, you're not able to go inside the buildings, but you can walk around campus as long as you have your face coverings on. Um, so real, real quickly, um, also, um, our department chairs especially meet with prospective students all the time. So yeah. how are we handling that now, Carrie? Do students go through you or do they contact the chairs directly? They can actually go directly through us. Um, Audrey, if you are able to grab that link for us, that would be awesome because we're really close to out of time here. Um, but there is a link just on our virtual page um, for students to sign up to meet with a faculty member. So you can easily, you can do that for sure. Yeah, I strongly um, encourage you to do that. They're eager to talk to you. And Tyler, I'm putting a link in here for you so you can contact our music faculty as well because you had a question about that. Um, thank you, Abigail. I'm so glad you've been able to see campus. That's great. And thanks for the virtual visit link there, Audrey. Um, I need to put a link in here too for you all because the next activity, it doesn't start until um, 1220, but it is the student panel. So you can hear from our students um, and you, this is the link to go back really into that um, student panel chat. Um, but I think, I think we made it through all the questions and you have our faculty's contact there um, for any future questions. So thanks so much for joining us and I'll let the two of you do your sign off too. Thank you so much. Hope to see you here. Bye. Thanks for coming. Great to see you all on video and good luck in your decisions and let us know if we can answer any questions. Thanks for all the thank yous, everyone. That's very sweet. And thanks to Brittany and Hoffman and Audrey and Carrie. We appreciate your help. Absolutely. We're happy to be here and so happy to see so many good questions and thanks everybody for your interest. We're excited you're interested in being a Zag. <laughs>